I think that, you know, what, what you've been covering here, you've been dealing with the great objective truths of Christianity. Mm. So as you mentioned, none of this has actually even introduced your responsiveness to it. <laughs> yeah. You know, he hasn't mentioned your faith yep. or repentance yep. or, you know, earnest love or, you know, or tenderness or anything. So he's hammering away at this, this great marble foundation, this unshakable, unalterable, immutable hope of the believer. But he doesn't end there. If we yeah. had time, we could go on, yeah. you know, through uh, especially chapters 12 and 13, where he's beginning yeah. to bring to bear, like, because of these facts, live this way. Yeah. We could think of another portion of Scripture that deals like this, where in Romans 3, 4, and 5, halfway through Romans 3, Paul gives the good news that it's never by rule-keeping, but by, uh, not by your rule-keeping, but by the rule-keeping of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who became your propitiatory sacrifice, Amen. satisfying the wrath of God lifting up his honor and his law's honor at the same time as providing mercy. Chapter 3. Chapter 4, that is embraced by faith because faith, chapter 5, unites you to a new mediator, mm. Jesus. All that doctrine, and it's not until chapter 6, verse 11, that we meet the very first time in the book of Romans that Paul gives a command. Yeah. Yeah. So reckon yourselves. Yeah. Live on these realities. Calculate them honestly biblically, and then present. Yeah. Um, so same thing, objective truth, then experiential or applied truth. Sometimes we get questions, um, I don't know, it, you know, in the church where you're pastoring, because of a heavy emphasis on the uh, application of truth. Yeah. Um, you, you can, I mean, there's always, I, I feel it as a pastor, uh, there's always the concern, I don't want to lean one way too far the other. Yep. And I remember a young lady coming to me uh, in college and saying, um, my church is not quite as experiential in their emphasis as you are, and so which one's right, and how do I live the Christian life? Because sometimes I think I don't want to focus too much on doctrine and forget experience, then yeah. the other side. And so I, I said to her, imagine um, that you're walking a tightrope, and you have this long pole, and on one side, on the far left side, is uh, objective truth. On the far right side is experienced truth. Hmm. Now, if you think the Christian life is the tightrope. And the way you keep from falling off is constantly shuffling it back and forth. Yeah. Too much experience, too much objective, too much head, too much heart. Then you're going to, that's not the way to do it. No. And you would wear yourself out. It's order. First, the great facts that you just reviewed. Yeah. Yeah. Then the great devotion of the heart flows Amen. in obedience. Yeah. Amen. You know, the theological way to say that is the imperatives are built on the indicatives. The first half of all the you epistles. You didn't like my tightrope illustration, oh. did you? <laughs> I was, I was, You're going to get all brainy on me. <laughs> uh, I loved it. Um, For yeah. those of you that are not in the third grade, <laughs> this is how we say it. <laughs> the first half of all the epistles are yeah. the indicatives. Yeah. It's what God has done for us in Christ. The second half, obviously, there's perforated lines. Sure. You know, there's some imperatives in the first and indicatives in the second, but it's basically that setup. It's what God has done for us in Christ, indicatives. Now, therefore, do imperatives. But you mentioned how Romans has its first exhortation. I just taught it Sunday uh, in chapter six on the reckon. So five and a half chapters of no exhortation. Right. Just breathtaking can I dare to believe this is true? Mm -hmm. And then he'll tell you what to do. Hebrews is actually the same way, and it's actually in this chapter. The, the setup of Hebrews in two parts is chapter 1 through 1018. 1019 through the end. The first part, and this is the last... We're, we're touching the last pinnacle of the first part in 10, 1 to 14. But in verse 19, same chapter, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Guess what no Old Testament high priest ever would have said to a million and a half Israelites? Come on. The in. holy of holies, <laughs> I can't explain it. Let's just all come in and take a peek. Jesus is saying, well, we're being told in the first ten and a half chapters, he is such a redeemer. And then in verse 19, he turns around and says to everybody in the whole camp, 
come on in to the Holy of Holies. And so there are exhortations. You know, these aren't just uh, spiritual ideas to keep in our head. But if we don't have the indicatives, the work of God for us in Christ, I do think our uh, tightrope illustration, we probably uh, default to do. I think we're workspace more by nature than we are grace-based sure. by nature. Yeah. So, Well, it, it's really humbling to us to be freely loved. For yeah. God to say, there's nothing lovely in you, but I have loved you infinitely. Deuteronomy 6. You think about, you know, if you went home and said to Tracy, your wife, honey, I all the way home, I just thought how much I love you. But I, but really, you know, the truth is, there's nothing about you that's lovely, but I'm just a great <laughs> kind of guy, you know? Yeah. So that, the natural man, really doesn't love grace. Yeah. Well, thank you for watching the clip. We hope that it was helpful for you. If you want to hear the full audio of that podcast, you can find it on any of your favorite podcast apps.